click this. This meeting is being recorded. Ooh, ooh, okay. I don't want to... We are recording. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and let people log on. We have a lot of people today. It looks like this session was um, sold out, so we have a lot of good information to give you. I am going to try to put my chat box down. You guys still continue to just check in and say hi with each other, which is great. Um, this is the 23-24 grant funding opportunity from the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. Next slide, please. So I am one of your presenters today, Tiffany Barto, Deputy Director of Operations for the Commission. I also have Jen DeGrosso, our Grants Manager on, and Stephen Maises, who is our Budget and Contract Analyst. This makes up your presenters for today's programming. Just a few little housekeeping, the attendees all here, we've got like 130 people, more people logging on. You guys are gonna all be on mute for this programming. We won't have a session at the end for Q&A because this is pretty long, but we do, again, encourage you, if we're not thorough in here, if there's anything that's specific to your organization, please feel free to send us an email, and we definitely are checking that daily to get back to you. Um, use the chat feature, again, to submit your questions, and as we are off and on with our presentations, we'll be able to answer your questions that you may have. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So for today, we're going to cover the CCSWG Women's Recovery Response, um, our grant funding opportunity available to you all, website access, um, application walkthrough. So this is going to be very thorough to cover how you are to apply. So today's um, agenda is really to walk you all through how to apply for this. Um, items that we are looking for as far as cost and eligible cost, um, the proposal review and selection process that's going to cover your scoring, the required verification that we need. We'll also cover a timeline of activities, progress reports, expenditures, and also an overview of our FAQs and where to find those. Next slide, please. So if you guys all don't know anything about the commission, I have said, I work for the commission on the status of women and girls, and they're like, there's a such thing? Very, very surprising, right? But, but it's not so much. So. For more than 50 years, the Commission on the Status of Women and Girls has identified and worked to eliminate inequities in state laws, practices, and conditions that affect California's women and girls. We are established as a state agency with 17 appointed commissioners in 1965. The Commission regularly assesses gender equity and health, safety, employment, education, and equal representation in the military and media. The Commission provides leadership through research, policy and program development, education, outreach, and collaboration, advocacy, and strategic partnerships. So we look forward to working with all of you um, now and in the future. So a little bit about the commission. There's a lot more information on our website. If you guys want to spend some time there, that would be great. And you have, obviously, because you know about this grant funding opportunity. So this grant funding opportunity allows for up to $5 million in grant funding, and that will support three categories. One of them is the statewide or local nonprofit that's established history of programming. And you guys are going to hear me go over this a couple times so you know exactly what you're applying for. An established history of programming and or services that directly support and align with the mission of Women and Girls Commission. It's also to provide direct services to support immediate needs for women through an economic security lens. Local government entities for the purpose of establishing new commissions and other grant-funded activities that directly support and align with the mission of Women and Girls Commission, and that's to improve the representation of all women's voices throughout California. And then lastly, local commissions that are established with a city or a county government, and to engage and strengthen existing local women's commissions to ultimately inform the statewide women's economic recovery blueprint. And if you all don't know, the commission um, did an awesome job of doing a Economic Recovery Blueprint. We have it up on our website. We also have a pretty lengthy book for you to take a look at. If you need a copy of that, we'd be happy to send one out to you, but we do have it available on our website. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at the blueprint um, for more, more issues that are happening to us that we're trying to recover from. Next slide, please. So the types of applications that we are looking for now are three. So they fall into these three categories for this funding opportunity. It's a new grant, which I hope this is what all of you guys are here for today. So if you're a new applicant, you just heard about this grant funding opportunity, 
This is for a statewide or local nonprofit. Again, establish history of programming or services that directly support and align with the mission of Women and Girls Commission. And then also local government entities conducting grant funding activities that support and align with the mission of Women and Girls Commission. So those, that's a new applicant. You all should be here if you're brand new, haven't received funding from us before. If you have received funding from us before in our prior grant funding opportunity last year, you're a renewal applicant. And that's an existing 22-23 grantee who are statewide or local nonprofit or a governmental organization in good standing who are applying for a second year of grant funding. So that renewal applicant is also going to have the same technical training piece next week. So if you are renewing, you will have a different training next week to cover items that we captured last season as you renew your application. The last category is local women's commission. So if you're a new applicant, brand new women's commission in a city or county government that has not received funding prior, and you're establishing a new commission, you also will have your training next week. Um, I encourage local commissions to, if you're new, you're here, come to the, also the local women's commission. There's some new information for you there as well. If you are a returning applicant, of course, you'll go to the renewal. So these are the three categories here for applicants that we are accepting under this grant funding period. We have a lot more information to cover for you all. I'm gonna start managing and looking at chat for questions that somebody may have, but I'm gonna kick this over to Steven. I think we have one more for eligibility. Oh, um, sorry, just that's okay. on that too, guys. So eligibility okay. requirements, just so you guys all know, for your eligibility for this um, grant funding period, it's applicants who are in the state of California only. We've got a couple questions on, can I be in Nevada and do the work here? Can I be in Oregon? And it's all California-based organizations. So statewide or a local nonprofit, again, Establish history of programming that provides direct services to align with the Women and Girls Commission. I see you, Sasha, I can get to your question. Um, local government entities for the purpose of establishing new commissions or, or other grant funded activity that support and align with the mission of Women and Girls Commission, so local government entities, and then local women's commissions that are established within a city or county or government. So must be one of these three categories, statewide local nonprofit, a local government entity or a local women's commission. And I think once uh, Jen later on in the programming, you will have Jen go over the full application. So we've had some questions about folks being individual. So if you are Tiffany and you're selling Tiffany's jewelry and you'd like to get nice jewelry out to women and girls as an individual, um, absolutely not. That type of uh, award is not gonna be granted here. This is gonna be strictly for statewide local nonprofit, local government entities or local women's commission based in the state of California, and that is the eligibility for this grant funding. Next slide, please. And I will go ahead and pass this over to Jen, and I'm gonna get to your questions right now, folks. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. This next phase of the presentation, we're just gonna go over some of the application materials and we'll walk through the actual application itself. But hopefully at this point, everyone is familiar with our grant funding landing page. This is for the 2324 Women's Recovery Response. It's on our website over here too, if you need a little refresher, but this is where all of the information that you need should be housed to apply for this. And um, over here, we just have the, the application period is now open. If you as an applying organization need any help with any questions um, outside of the technical assistance workshop. Um, so if, if we weren't able to answer a specific sort of niche question that you may have in your particular scenario, please reach out to us. We're monitoring our grants at women.ca.gov inbox um, Monday through Friday. And we're getting back, especially Stephen is getting back to everyone um, with lightning speed. And um, so if, if you do have a question Question, please send it in there. Um, we'll go over, there's different email inboxes when you're actually submitting your application, but in terms of grantee support, questions, inquiries, if you want to know if um, you know the services that you provide are eligible under the grant, just shoot us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And that's again, grants at women.ca.gov. And then over here on our landing page, you'll see just a timeline of the upcoming events and trainings. 
Um, so we're over here, technical assistance webinar for new applicants. And um, if anyone's on the line and you happen to be a renewal applicant, um, you might wanna join us instead, Monday, February 6th at 11 a.m. It'll be the same format, but we're going over the renewal application, which is modeled a little bit differently for our returning grantees. And then if any folks with local commissions, either established or looking to build one, are on the line, you might also want to join us February 6th, this coming Monday at 1 p.m. because we will speaking specifically, we will be speaking specifically to local commission applicants. Um, again, because their applications um, framed a little bit differently than our new grantees. The applications are due, we'll say this a couple times, but reminder, reminder, 4 p.m. February 17th and on um, Friday, not this coming Friday, not the next one, the following one, February 17th, applications are due to the inbox. 4 p.m. is the cutoff time. We will not be accepting, the system itself is not accepting anything after 4 p.m. on that day. So just keep that in mind. And then um, we'll go over timeline as well um, in, during the course of the presentation, but you'll see that during March 17th through the 24th is when we're starting to award um, and award and notify grantees who have been approved for funding. And then hope, hoping to announce by April 3rd, all final grant awards and then work can actually begin, change the world starts April 3rd and that will continue through March 31 of next year, 2024. Okay, so this, um, if you just scroll down on the website, that page I just showed you, you'll scroll down. This is where you actually can obtain the application materials that we're talking about today. So hopefully everyone on this call is over here in the new applicant universe, a new grantee application. And this is just a reminder, this is if your organization has not received prior funding from us and you're either a nonprofit or you're a local government entity and you're seeking funding to support the existing and emerging needs of women in California impacted by the pandemic. This is a reminder again over here when you're ready to submit your completed application, it goes to newgrantsatwomen.ca.gov. That's where you'll submit. So over here, if you select application number one, it's going to pop up a fillable Word document for you. Um, and that's what we'll go through now. These are the main funding areas that we're gonna talk about application and applicant information, the funding opportunity section in the application, uh, your proposal and budget narratives, the cost sheet templates, and then we do wanna really, um, we'll focus again on ineligible costs. We mentioned that earlier, but that'll um, pop up again. I'm just gonna admit some folks in the waiting room. We have five more people joining us. Hello to our joiners. All right, so this is the new grantee application for this upcoming grant cycle. And um, this is all a fillable PDF. We'll go through this page by page. But one more time, friendly reminder, questions on how to fill this out or if you get stumped on something, those go to grants.women.ca.gov. Submissions, when you're completely ready to submit your app, send it to newgrants.women.ca.gov. So page, the first couple of pages is just an outline of the purpose of the solicitation, which we've um, spoken to already, but this has good materials for those of us who aren't super familiar, um, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with the commission itself. And then again, this piece is really important. We've already had a lot of questions about this um, in terms of eligibility. Again, local governments and statewide or local nonprofits. And Tiffany spoke to this as well. Individuals um, are ineligible for funding under this grant. Sorry, my dog. Um, <laughs> we, um, we have gotten a lot of questions about that. So individuals who are not established with a local government or a nonprofit entity are not eligible for funding under this grant. All right, and this is another key question that we keep getting. And so um, please make sure you pay attention to this section up here, which is the availability of funding section. This is um, funding is a um, we have funding in amounts of twenty five thousand dollars up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, depending on the proposed grant activities 
that you want to have funded. And we'll speak to this a little bit later in the application process itself, but this $250,000 cap is for intermediary organizations who will be turning around and re-granting funding to local partners. So if you are not an intermediary organization, you're not planning on re-granting in any capacity, you'll be applying for $25,000 to $100,000. And we'll walk through that. It, it sort of flows more organically once we get to that point in the, in the training. Again, submission deadline, February 17th, 4 p.m. This is just other contact information. This is an overview of what the funds are supposed to support. I will let everyone read through that in the application. And now other terms and conditions that you'll be bound by. And now we'll get to the good part, the applicant information. We'll need you to fill out this first section for sure of the application. Name of legal applicant organization. So this will be whoever is applying. In some cases, we have a sponsor organization and a sponsored organization. So you will know, hopefully, if you have that dynamic. Um, so in that case, we're needing information from both organizations. So the bigger sponsor organization will enter their name in for legal applicant, and then the, spon the smaller sponsor org will have their information in here too. If you are just applying on your own, you don't have a sponsor, a sponsored organization, then you can just skip the green parts altogether, ignore those, those are not relevant to you, you'll just fill out the blue. And then the proposed amount here, um, again, I think we'll speak to that down a little bit below, but this is the funding amount that you are requesting from us as an organization. And again, this application amount section speaks to that. It defines if you're an intermediary organization, which would be any organization that supports the provision of services by another org rather than providing the direct service itself. Um, usually they're technical assistance providers or like capacity building organizations in some cases. So if you're a re-grantor, you can have up to $250,000 in your request. If you're not a regrantor, then $100,000 is the max for your proposal. Okay, so down here for communities, this is where we're asking you to list out as an organization on the ground, what counties and cities, synod districts and assembly districts is your organization serving? You should know the city and county, hopefully, right? <laughs> but Senate District is a little new. We didn't have this on um, prior application. So if you need to look that up, there's a little link here that you can follow. You'll just plug in the information for your nonprofit and it'll pop up who your Senate District is and who your Assembly District is. And you'll plug it in here. Then we'll ask you to um, list out how long in years and months your organization has been in existence in this box. Then we would like to know the sort of scope of your funding historically. Um, and we asked you to select if you've received funds from the state, um, the federal government, uh, maybe a city or county government, other could be like a private foundation, for example, donations, et cetera. Or maybe in some cases you haven't received any, you're a fledgling organization, you haven't received any funding yet. So you would select that. And then we're asking you to fill in the information for what you have received. Um, if you have a huge breadth of funding, like 20 years of funding, for example, that goes way back, um, you don't need to put the whole universe that you have here. We just want to know probably active grants um, are good enough. If you have a really long history, just narrow it down to active current grants, please. Okay, this next section is pretty important, and this applies only to nonprofits. Um, again, this prompt reminds you if you're not a nonprofit, don't worry about it, skip it. If you are a nonprofit, we want to know if you're currently registered with the Department of Justice. We want to know if you're registered as a business with the Secretary of State. And we want to know if you're in good standing with the Franchise Tax Board. So Tiffany will speak to this a little bit later in more detail in the presentation. But um, we're just looking for a yes or no. And if something's, you have paperwork submitted or something, but your website status still says pending, for example, with Department of Justice, we need to hear about that. So please put that in the box here if you replied no to any of the above. 
This question's just asking about your exemption status, yes or no. And um, this is important. This will help us if you can help get this to us earlier with your application submission. It will help speed things up on the back end when we actually want to turn around and grant you funds. If you are exempt with the IRS, please attach your exemption letter with your application submission. So in a little bit, I'll talk about what that actually email looks like with your application and where you submit it to, but please make sure you'll attach an application as one attachment and then you'll attach your IRS letter as well. And then a few other important questions about uh, violating federal criminal law. We're looking for a yes or no over there. Um, lawsuits, etc. cetera. Um, if there's any audit findings or monitoring findings, please enter that information in as well. And then we wanna know a little bit about your accounting system for tracking expenditures and receipts of program funds, because we will be asking for that type of accountability when you submit your progress reports to us, we'll need to have very clear, clean expenditure tracking. So this should be a yes or no answer. And if it's a no, um, please explain your proposal for how you would uh, track grants moving forward. I'm gonna admit some more folks in the waiting room. Okay, so this next uh, section is a funding opportunity for new grant applicants. Again, please make sure you read through the goals, the priorities, et cetera. I think um, Tiffany will speak on this a little bit, but um, these are our four areas that we're really focused on for this grant cycle. Improved access and affordability of child and or elder care services. Uh, utilization and uptake of safety net programs, achieved reskilling through accreditation, certification, vocational or educational programs, and lastly, enhanced financial ability to grow economic security. This next section of your proposal is very important. This is the narrative. We're asking for a max of 1500 words just because we have a lot of these to read. So please make this concise, um, but very to the point. These are the three areas we'd like you to address in your proposal response. So that will be describing the needs of your community, the history and the purpose of your organization and how additional funding from CCSWG will support the organization's ability to serve the identified target community. Then we'd also like you to dive into how you propose to use the grant funds to support the stated goal and how funds support the listed priorities directly above. And that's just asking you to tie back into these. These are the areas we're looking to fund. So how does your work tie into the one of those, maybe several of those? The last question, describe how the impact will be measured and sex, success will be achieved and how you propose to increase impact for women and girls with this funding. The next section is target populations. So for the work you're doing under this agreement, again, this is for your proposal, not necessarily your whole organization. We have a lot of organizations that help women throughout the state, for example, but we wanna know for this exact award, are you helping any of these folks, low income, unemployed, et cetera? So please um, be specific about the actual audience of women you're looking to impact with this award. And then this is similar to what we saw earlier above in the application. We just wanna know um, a lot of times this area, the target communities under this grant is a little more nuanced. So um, I know Tiffany says this a lot, but we have grantees who are doing work in LA, but LA is huge. Um, so what, what specific little pockets of LA are you talking about, for example? And um, so that's where, you're try where you will define that um, as detailed as you can kind of zoom, zoom in on the work you're doing. The next section is the budget narrative, and this is where you're going to propose your budget and how will it support the objectives of your overall proposal. So that's basically tying money to work. We want to see how they're connected. Um, and please try to keep it to a thousand words max. All right, and the next section is cost sheets. So please make sure you review this because we have some requirements um, when you are plugging in information for your cost sheets um, about salaries, 
benefits, operating costs, et cetera. There's a couple definitions in here that should help you be able to fill out the cost sheet better. But again, um, we've had questions where some folks maybe might not know where to plug in something in the cost sheet. So you can always send that to us, grants at women.ca.gov. If you need help on what line item, we, you should kind of be directing that stuff to and we're happy to answer that. That's not a problem. Please make sure you read about invoices because um, let's see, um, this is the whole process for like the award letter, state controller's office, et cetera. And we grantees must have statements of expenditures with each progress report according to the scheduled due dates. We'll talk about the progress reports a little bit later, but um, we just really wanna highlight that, that that is a requirement. And that's why we're asking further above in the application what your actual expenditure um, cost tracking processes with your organization because you will have to submit statements with your quarterly reports. Please make sure to review the key dates. A lot of these are overlaps of what we mentioned earlier on the website, but it also expands a little bit. Um, let's see, like our, our first re progress report, for example, um, if every everything should be running smoothly and you should be submitting a progress report, your first one, July 14th of this year. Here's the layout of the quarterly reports. You'll see first, second, third, final report over here, due dates, um, the report period that that'll cover. And then another just reminder, statements of expenditures will be required with each progress report. And um, on that note, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we do have a, a reporting template that will issue to you once you're awarded as, an, a, grant, as a grantee. So you have that template to use, you know what the expectations are, um, and you know that that's what you'll use to submit all of your reports to us on the quarterly basis. Okay, and then this is the Exhibit A cost sheet template uh, for new grantees. And you'll plug in up here your organization name. You can also add sponsored organization if you want to, the proposal title. And then this box is really important, this area over here, the category of funding. We have other and we have regranting. So again, if you're serving as an intermediary organization, turning around and regranting funds to local partners who are going to be probably providing direct services on the ground, you would check this regranting box. So then we know that you're eligible for up to $250,000 in funding. If you're not regranting, you're not an intermediary organization, you're going to select this other box. And then we all know that your max is going to be $100,000. It doesn't have to be 100,000, that's just the cap for it. It should be 25,000 to 100,000 if you're one of these other organizations. So over here, you'll enter um, all of the information under personnel, which may include salary, wages, or benefits. And we do not want to see a lump sum for anything. So we shouldn't see like nonprofit staff listed here and $100,000 over here. We don't wanna see that. We wanna see very detailed breakout out of what role we're talking about, how much they need to do their work under this grant. We want to see their benefits called out separately from their salary and just have it very clear over here. No lump sum listed here. For operating expenses, you can enter anything that you think might fall under here. Supplies and materials is an example, but there could be others, um, whatever applies to your organization. If you need to design brochures, for example, um, that would go over here and then the cost. And please make sure all of this is tying into your actual narrative. When we're reading through the narrative, you should really call out um, the roles that we're going to see in the book budget, those should be addressed in the narrative. If you are, again, wanting to do brochures as an example for maybe domestic violence um, legal outreach, we should see that spoken to in the narrative above, and then we should also see it listed out here. So these things really do need to tie together. Otherwise, it, it doesn't, we just, when we're scoring it, we're not going to know why you threw um, some random expense in here if it's not tied to the purpose and the narrative above. For regrantees, so for those up here, regranting intermediary organizations eligible for up to 250, those will go here. For everyone else, you won't have to worry about that section. 
consultants will go here. And um, please do describe what type of consultant. Um, in a lot of cases, you might not know the name of the consultant or firm or whoever or designer you want to hire yet, but the type of consultant or the type of service that can be that is being that you want to have provided, have that in here. So it could be, you know, brochure. Um, designer, the designer of the materials could go here. Down here, we're asking for the indirect cost rate. Um, so some people will not be asking for indirect costs, so you would put no. Some people have a state negotiated cost rate. Others might have a federally negotiated cost rate. Someone might not have a negotiated cost rate at all, but you're just proposing a rate that you would like to have awarded in this. That's fine too, you would just click this. And so then this little, this box here is just, we wanna know what percentage are you, are, is it a, are you proposing a 5% overhead, 10% overhead? Um, enter that in here, please. And this will be your grand total um, entered here for the max amount or the total amount that you're requesting. All right, I think that's it. We're gonna head over to an eligible cost because this question has come up a lot. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing right with you guys. Let's see. Is that full screen for everyone now? I think so. Um, okay, so this is a list of ineligible costs. So the following list includes ineligible costs. Grant applications featuring these costs may be denied or we may need to kick the, back, the grant application back to you and have you revise it to remove those costs before we can move forward with an award. And these will be incorporated just so you know this list, if you can't memorize it right now in you know, a minute, <laughs> we'll put this up on our frequently asked questions. Um, so you'll have the complete list there. And that's housed on our website. I'll go over that in just a moment. So this is the universe of things that we will not grant funds for. That includes tuition, food and beverage, corkage fees, lobbying, costs already billed directly, travel costs, um, and that's outside of state rates and per diem rates, just so you know. Overtime, equipment not specifically needed for the project, deductibles for insurance, audit costs, legal fees, depreciation or use allowances for buildings and equipment, licensing fees, bank fees, advance payments, contingencies, appearance fees or speaking fees, and insurance costs. None of those are eligible under this grant. Okay, so once you have your grant application filled out, you have all of your sections filled out, you've saved it somewhere, then all you have to do is pull up your email and attach it like this. This is just a little example. Get my little laser pointer. Um, you'll attach it like this. And again, if there is like an IRS exemption letter, for example, that we referenced above, attach that here too, please. You'll have your filled out grant application and you're sending it in. You can label it whatever you want, new application if you'd like. And then you're sending it in to new grants at women.ca.gov. Once it's submitted to us, you sh you'll get an auto reply um, that says this, basically that thank you for submitting your new grant application. And it this should not be construed as an award or that we're moving forward with um, contracting for this. None of that. This is just a notification, an auto reply that we received your submission. And just to reiterate over here, these are the key emails, key dates. Everything is due by February 17th at 4 p.m., no later. The system's not accepting applications after four. And for those applying for new grants, hopefully most of you in the call today, that'll be for new grants at women.ca.gov. That's where you'll submit your application to. And then if there's anyone on the call for renewals or local commissions, these are your other you'll use those emails instead. And then again, if you have questions on how to fill out the app or if something applies or if um, the work that you do throughout the state is in alignment with the mission of this granting effort, then submit that to grants at women.ca.gov, please. So two separate emails. 
Okay, now I'm going to turn this back over to Tiffany. She's going to talk a little bit about the scoring process for after the application has been submitted. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get to all of your questions. We are not ignoring you. You guys have a lot of great questions in here. So sometimes I'm sending it directly to you. So I've sent them to Sasha, to Desiree. Um, so you folks, just bear with us as we try to get your, your questions answered. Um, again, this is informational for y'all to know how to do your, your application process. And I definitely will, some of you guys have sent you notes to send me a note um, to the grants inbox. You can send it to Stephen, um, Jen, or myself. Um, I, We'll set some meetings with you folks on some of the personal questions that you have for your org. So I want to make sure I shout that out to you all. Um, Brett, I see your question. I can get to you in just a second. So for the scoring process, this is really important for you guys to know. Um, all of it is, but this is really important for you guys to know. We have a team that's going to be scoring all of these applications. Again, we have three buckets of applications. So we're doing local commissions, renewal, and we're doing brand new applicants, which you all are here for this today. That final score for each applicant is gonna be ranked. Proposals on all of your apps are numerical, so there's no notes that are taken. We're just reviewing. We have a grant review process rating sheet. Um, it's gonna, it's, we're not gonna show it here, but we do have it up on our website. Um, and this is the location where you can find it. Jen has this um, highlighted here. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but it is gray. And we have what I call like a, um, informational item for you guys just to take a look at what is used to determine your score. So note that it's tentative. It's not the exact thing that we use, but we want to be very transparent with you on our scoring and what that looks like for this grant funding opportunity. And that can be changed by the commission at any time. So once we take a look at apps and we're scoring and we're trying to make sure that things align and fit, we are able to adjust that as needed. Um, also, the priority for funding is based on a, a, a ton of considerations. So we're looking at your overall impact uh, of the submission of your grant proposal, your geographic distribution. I want to harp on the geographic distribution because I think Jen uh, talked about this a little earlier. A lot of people are in LA. We have a lot of applicants last year in LA. Um, we have a 17-member commission. These commissioners are also taking a look at what are the geographical areas that we are trying to hit. I think I will go more into detail when, when I talk about the local commission, but if you're like in a very rural area where there's no commission and there's a service that's needed for women and girls, please try to reach out to that area. It's critical. Um, we have done a map of the areas that are not being located, um, and that is difficult for people who are in rural areas in LA who have no services. So it's great to take a look at exactly honing in on what your ge geographical distribution is as well. Um, the availability of funds that we have to give out, and then gaps in needs and services. That's just a little bit about the scoring process. Next slide, please. The rating sheet, um, we have the rating sheet available for you guys to take a look at. This is us. This is us being able to rate your application. And so what you're going to take a look at, I'm sorry if this is small, but what you guys are going to take a look at here is the five scoring rubric criteria. So what we're going to fill out is the application category, how much you're asking for, and how well you align with what we're looking at. So your goal alignment here is to make take a look at how you are improving the lives of California's women and girls who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. So you all, you guys are brand new here. So um, what happened under COVID is women were hit the hardest, women's programs were stopped, child care was stopped, 100% of job loss for women in 2020, affected everyone's lives. So what we are doing here is trying to figure out what we could do to have a recovery for women and put them back whole as we were pre-pandemic, although we all know it wasn't whole during the pre-pandemic. So things got worse for us. So we're making sure that you are intentional in an intervention for an equitable recovery response towards women and girls. That's your goal alignment. The priority issues here and I will cover all of these. We are trying to measure your outcomes based on improved access and affordability of child or elder care. We didn't have an elder care card up for last year, but we have noticed that there is not a lot of organizations that are doing work here for elder care for women. So we definitely want to see those numbers increase this year. An increased utilization and uptake of safety net programs that offer services that support basic needs such as shelter, food, and clothing. 
Um, we also noticed that there's quite a bit of DV, so domestic violence organizations, but we'd like to see um, more numbers in that as well. Um, and achieved reskilling and upskilling through accreditation, certification, um, vocational and educational programming, um, and enhanced financial ability to grow economic security, assets, and wealth building. So those are some priority issues that you guys take a look at when you're doing your application. Who are you hitting? Who is the target that you are trying to help? Um, so take a look at those for the priority issues. Also, we have geographic distribution. I just talked about that, but again, that's to the degree in which you are hitting areas that are underserved. So your geographic service area, again, LA is huge and we've got a lot of people who do a lot of things just in this one central area. We like to see that grow and be dispersed a little bit more than just particular counties. Um, also this, um, for the geographic service area, what are the needs that are happening in that area that are, that are characteristic to women and girls that are identified in that community? So that's key as well. Um, Amy, I see your question and that's a good one and um, I will get to you in the chat. Um, your overall impact, so the rate um, in which your proposal can describe an intervention that will be implemented in order to achieve maximum success. So you will have to do this is like, like the thousand words here that you guys need to be very specific in what you're trying to achieve. And if there's a gap, there's no services for a particular area, what are you doing to implement a specific service for women and girls in that area and what do you desire as an outcome for that? That's your overall impact. And then your budget with a lot of budget questions, happy to have one-on-ones -on -one with you guys in the budget. It's really important on your budget because it has to support your objectives and your activities. So I have not seen it, but I have to call it out on the budget to make sure that it really aligns with the work that you're doing. And we do site visits too. So this is helpful for us to see, you know, how you put your money into action, what you're asking for, um, those, for those of you who are awarded this grant, and, and Stephen will cover this under the agreement, uh, once we do site visits, we do come out, we help out, we come see what you guys are doing and how you've made an impact. And so it's important for you to spend the dollars down because we don't want that money back. So we want you to go out in the community and do the work and the, the good work that you guys are doing. It's wonderful for us to tell the story and it's wonderful for people to see that we need more money so we can continue this work. That's your, your budget. So if you guys take a look at um, all of these goal alignments, this is like a rough estimate for you guys to see what we're looking at as we are rating. So it is important that you guys write your proposals really well and it's hitting exactly what we're looking for. Um, so this is a little bit about what's happening on the rating sheet. Um, next slide, please. So verification requirements. I will try not to go overboard on the verification requirements, but this has happened from last year and I wanna make it very clear to everybody is for the verification you have to have all of your documents totally solid before you actually apply. And what that means is if you are a charitable organization, you are registering your business as a charitable organization to the Department of Justice. Uh, Jen's gonna go ahead and pop in the chat for us the three organizations that you guys will need. So the um, Office of the Attorney General, also known as Department of Justice, people think it's two different places, same place. Um, Rob Bonta is, uh, is our leader here for the DOJ. And that charitable, your charitable organization must be registered if it's a charitable organization. We do know that not all organizations are a charitable organization. So then you would register with the Secretary of State. And the Secretary of State is for California nonprofit corporation or a limited liability company. And you are required to file every two years in the month of registration in even or odd years based on the year that you registered. And you have to have that in good standing. Some of you all also may be applicable to the IRS verifications, and that's for smaller tax exempt organizations with an annual growth up to $50,000. You may have to fill out um, forms from, with them, and that's a 990N form. So those three, y'all should be really taking a look at what your organization does and what requirements that you need to have your business to be fully active and in good standing. When I talk about good standing, that means that all of your Payments have been paid. So when you register your business with the DOJ, there's a fee that goes with that, and you have to keep that up. And once we run your what we call verification, so hypothetical, Tiffany's Diapers is going to register my business as a charitable organization. I'm going to have a number that I'm going to get assigned from the DOJ. Once I submit my application, you know, to Jen, I'm going to have that number that's written down, which Jen went over in the application. I'm going to also run that number before I can cut you any check. 
Once that number comes back and it says, oh no, you're delinquent because you haven't paid for six months, I have to get that paid up before I can actually apply for this grant. You must have your 501c3 ready to go. Some of you guys may need fiscal sponsors or sponsors to help you because you're not really at the 501c3 status yet, and that's okay. We've had fiscal sponsors who will be responsible to help you get ready under this grant funding opportunity. So you have to have your DOJ or your Secretary of State all in good standing. I will let you guys know that the State Controller's Office, we are a very small agency, so we have to pull in the Fiscal, which is a state accounting system called Fiscal. The Fiscal works with the State Controller's Office to actually cut you a check. So there's several processes to this where the commission doesn't have any signing authority to cut you guys a check. So it is, it goes through two bodies before you guys actually get a paper check. And by the way, it will be a paper check. It's not um, an electronic fund transfer by any means. So the state controller will also run a double check after we've done our verification to make sure that you're in good standing. They also do what you call a name match for your tax ID. If your name does not match your tax ID, there's a problem, they're gonna put it on hold and they'll reach out to us and let us know and I will be in contact with you to let you guys know how to get that fixed. Um, so I just wanna stress here on the, on the verification requirements that all of these items, your DOJ, your Secretary of State, your if you have tax issues with the Franchise Tax Board, I actually spoke with them this week um, as we were rolling out this information and uh, they too will not, you know, if you have tax issues, they are not, they'll send it up and we will not be able to cut you guys any checks. So I just wanna make sure that we are, are very clear on the verification process that we have to do as a commission on our due diligence to make sure folks are in active, good standing. Active just simply means that you have paid and you're in good standing and there's nothing that's delinquent. So we are not pushing back on anybody on our own accord, right? We want everybody to be successful at this grant funding opportunity, but please make sure that you follow through with your DOJ requirements, if it applies to you as a charitable organization, <clears throat> and or registering your business through the Secretary of State. Um, all of that has to be fine-tuned prior to you applying. What we have noticed last year, and I'll bring this up, is people weren't necessarily ready, and it was like, I'm going to apply for this, but it has you have to have all of this set to go when you apply with us, you actually have a number that we do verify. Um, and I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I can, because some of this is individual to an organization. And so if you guys have some issues, um, individual to, to you, I'm happy to walk you through and we can have a conversation about that process. So that is a little bit on the verifications that have to be met in order for us to get you processed through the state accounting system, through the state controller, so the state controller can approve and write you guys a check. Next slide, please. All right, um, thanks, Tiffany. So I'll take um, care of this slide. Um, so what we're gonna talk about now is the required documents. And these required documents are going to be for organizations that have been selected for funding. So once an organization has been selected for funding, there will be some required documents that we will need to be able to move forward and finalize this grant award. The first one that we're going to cover is the payee data record form, or also known as the STD form 204. Now this is required for most of the awarded applicants and the only exclusion from this would be local governments. Local governments will not have to fill out this STD form 204. And basically with this STD form 204 is it will provide a supplier's taxpayer identification number and it, it will be used to determine when the payment to the supplier is reportable and is needed in order for state controller's office to be able to process payments for this grant award. There are gonna be some other questions in there like mailing address, um, what type of entity the organization is, um, which we will kind of look over on the next um, slide. But basically that is what the STD form 204 is. The next form we're going to talk about is the payee data record form, also known as the STD form 205. Now this form has two purposes. One, as we said before, local governments do not have to use STD form 204. They do have to fill out the STD form 205. This is one of the required documents that they will need. They also are gonna need another form, which we'll talk about right after this. Um, and the other use for this would be if an organization has a different 
address or remnants address from the address that they put on the STD-204. So we will reach out to the organization if we get any, um, any pushback and we will send a STD-205 form if that remnants address is different from the mailing address. The next form we're gonna talk about is the government agency tax taxpayer ID form. So this is the second form that is required for government entities. It's basically also known as a TIN form. And this will just allow us in the state controller's office to establish the unique identification of the government entity. The next form or document we will talk about is the award letter. Now this document basically is the contract. It is the document that legally grants funds to the awarded applicant and is not valid until the awarded applicant, which includes either the sponsored organization and the legal applicant, if the legal applicant has a sponsored organization, and CCSWG have signed. So basically what we'll do is we'll send this award letter to the, um, to the organization that has been awarded. We will, we do like to stress that we want the organization to look over it carefully. If there are any questions or concerns, please reach out to us and we can set up a meeting to go over anything that you have for those questions and concerns. And then once it is signed on the organization's end, and if they do have a, um, a legal applicant, um, I mean, a sponsored organization as well, once we get those signatures, we will sign it on our end and then that organization will receive a copy for their records. Um, and again, it's basically just the contract um, that um, kind of goes along with this funding. The next form we're going to talk about is the Acknowledgement of Work Commencement Authorization. Now, this certifies that any work under the awarded grant will not commence until the award letter is fully executed by both the awarded applicant and CCSWG. So this will be sent out before the award letter, and we want to make sure that this is signed and we receive it back because we do not want any work officially done or capacitated at all until we have that award letter signed by all parties. Once we have that award letter signed by all parties, then we the organization can go ahead and start working using the funding. And the last document we're going to talk about is the IRS exemption letter. Now, some organizations might um, have this um, as far as when it comes to um, an IRS exemption letter. If this organization does have one, please provide that exemption letter with your, or, uh, with your application. We want to make sure we have that so we don't have any hiccups down the road. If you are awarded, we want to make sure to have that paperwork ready to go. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the, um, we, we took a couple screenshots to show the required document examples. So the one on the left is the STG, STD 204. I will say these do look small, um, but again, once, once you do receive these, um, if you are awarded, then we can go over these in details if you do have any questions. Um, but again, the STD 204 is on the left hand side and that basically um, the organization will put the mailing address, what type of entity they are, their tax ID number. We also ask for um, the status of where they are located, if you're in California or not. And then we do ask for signatures. I will say when it comes to these documents, we do ask that these are signed via Adobe. Um, we do have issues running into um, when we do DocuSign or have organizations use DocuSign. Um, if you do not have Adobe, there are Adobe free readers that you can sign with this. Um, it just makes our process easier because um, sometimes we do have to send the documents back because we're not able to sign them on our end because of the DocuSign. Um, so again, we highly stress if you can please sign it via um, uh, Adobe Digital, that would be great. Um, the middle one is the STD-205 form. Now, again, this one is specifically for local governments or, um, again, if the organization has a remnants, 
address different from the mailing address. So it'll ask for name, if you have a, a DBA uh, or a different business name, and then it goes into what the remnants address is, and then that can be filled out along with the contact name and then signatures. And then last but not least, on the right, we do have the government agency taxpayer ID form or the TIN form. This is strictly for local governments. They're the only ones that will be filling it out. And then again, this will help us receive that tax um, ID number. All right, next slide. And then a couple more required documents. Examples, um, on the left, the two pages towards the left are your award letter. This is what our award letters look like, um, which is also basically the contract. So again, we do highly recommend that every organization reads through this carefully. So make sure to go over it. Again, if there's any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to us so that we can set a meeting and then we can go over those questions and concerns. Um, you will notice on the right, um, on that second page, there is that signature. We also have a remnants address area this needs to be filled out we did run into issues where it wasn't filled out and then we had to send it back um, and then it, it leads to delays so we want to make sure that that remnants address part is also filled out as well even though we do have the SD 204 and the 205 form that does need to be filled out as well and again once we have all parties signed this will be sent back to the organization for their records all right the document in the middle is the Acknowledgement of Work Commencement Authorization Disclaimer. So again, this will be sent out um, and then this will need to be signed. And then once signed, work cannot be done until all parties have signed that award letter that we just went over. So again, we will send this out before the award letter. Once we get it signed back, then again, that's just stating that the organization will not perform any work. You, prior to, to the funding, especially um, until that award letter is signed by all parties. And then to the right, we do have an IRS tax exemption letter. This is basically what it looks like. Um, this is a real example. So again, if your organization does have this letter, please submit this with your application. So then we can have this for our records and then it can make things smoothly when it comes to um, the funding part. Okay, next slide. All right, so this one's a real important um, slide. It's We're gonna talk about the timeliness of required documents. Now, um, it's really important because when it comes to us going back and forth with documents, we're gonna need to make sure that everything is tight. And with that, due to year-end fiscal reconciliation requirements, failure, failure to sign and return any required documents, including the award letter within three business days of receipt will result in a forfeiture of this grant opportunity. So we have it as set as three business days because again, due to year-end fiscal reconciliation, we need to be able to process these documents quickly. So again, once you're um, awarded, we want to be able to move quickly with these documents back and forth. Um, so you will, once you do receive a, an email from us with these documents, you will have three business days for them to get signed. Now, again, life happens, stuff happens. If something does come up, please make sure to reach out to us so then we can work with you. Um, we always, you know, we'll, we'll always work with the organizations, um, you know, so just again, make sure, please reach out to us so we can work with you. Um, it's always better and then it, we can move forward. Um, and another disclaimer, please be advised, there may be a delay between when the award letter is fully executed and when your organization receives funds. This along goes with that three business days. A lot of times it depends on the, the paperwork, the documents, are they filled out correctly? And then we do have to work with the state controller's office since they are the ones that are submitting the pay warrants to your organizations, or I should say the checks. We do not submit the checks. We do not have the checkbook. State controller's office are the ones that do that. So everything basically goes through them. So again, there sometimes are delays with that. So we just wanna give you a heads up that again, there might be delays between the award letter when it is fully executed and when your organization does receive the funds. And again, like just to um, reiterate what Tiffany said, it will be a paper check. We do not do direct transfers. So again, 
that might take an extra week or two just to receive that check because it is sent via USPS. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right, um, so next we just wanted to give you a kind of snapshot of the upcoming year and the timeline of activities that you can expect. We're over here in January with the applications available. We just entered February. Um, so for those on the call who maybe joined late or maybe you were on a different call, <laughs> you're not a new applicant, we still have upcoming a webinar, a technical assistance training, which will mirror the same format. And that's for renewal applicants. So for those who received funding from us last year and for local commissions, both local commissions who are new, wanting to build um, and also returning local commissions. Um, that's a very niche training. So we have a separate one for folks who are um, wanting to do that work on the ground. Um, again, February 17th, 4 p.m. Applications are due no later than 4 p.m. And then I spoke to this a little bit earlier, but this is the window March 17th through 24th is when we're looking to award um, uh, or notice awardees that they've been selected. Final grant awards announced April 3rd. And then your grant activities will continue. We're looking at the first quarter progress report due July 14th. Grant activities continue. October 13th is the due date for the second quarterly progress report. More grant activities continue. And then heading into 2024, January 12th, we have the third progress report. All grant activities should wrap up by March 31 of 2024. And then by 4-12, April 12th, uh, your final report will be due. All right, and we spoke to this a little bit earlier as well, but we just want to reiterate some information about the progress reports and expenditures. So um, as soon as we have you set up, if you're awarded as, an, as a grantee, we have your award letter executed, you're starting to do your work, we will issue you a progress report and expenditure template in advance. So you have that, you know it's going to be expected in those reports, and that'll be well in advance of when they're actually due. And we just wanted to give everybody a heads up that we're actually in the procurement process right now for a new grants management platform. And so over the course of the upcoming grant cycle, we're going to be integrating all of our information, like contact information for you guys, progress report information, reminders, all of that stuff will be in the new system. So that'll be, you know, it's a work in progress, but we're going to notify you in advance when the system is actually available. Um, so you'll have plenty of notice. And then the system is supposed to be very user friendly for grantees. So it's not going to be a heavy lift for you, but we are going to conduct some trainings on the new system once it's up and running just so you're familiar with it and you're not totally feeling blindsided by this new system that's been, been rolled out. And I just wanna reiterate, um, we're running into this a lot when we're trying to reconcile reports from all of our current grantees from this past cycle that we're in right now. Um, a lot of times staff turns over or contact information changes or you have a new email inbox that you set up with your organization. Whatever that is, please make sure that you loop us into any updates in terms of contact information. If you have a new executive director come on, we need to know that we need to have their email address because we're sending a lot of information out to the email that we had on file. And a lot of times that's changed over the course of the year. So if you do have updates, please keep us in the loop. Email that to grants at women.ca.gov so we can make sure that your profile is up to date and we can contact you when we need to. Okay, so this is um, this we're speaking to the FAQs. I think we're trying to field some of those right now, especially the general ones that I think we, applies to a, a broader audience. There are some niche questions in here that we, we probably won't get to, but so do reach out to us. But for general FAQs, we're working on compiling a list. There's already one up right now on our website. If you scroll just a little bit down below the applications, you'll see FAQs and it's just a downloadable document. 
You'll see our revision date too at the bottom. Um, so we're working on updating that as frequently as we can as more common questions roll in. So please do visit um, that document frequently if you're looking for some more answers. And again, if you have a sort of niche questions, question, a nuanced question, uh, feel free to email us to grants at women.ca.gov and we're happy to provide an answer for you. All right, I'll kick this over to Tiffany for the last few slides. Thank you, Jen. Um, so it looks like we are coming down to a close on this um, presentation. So I just wanna let everybody know, you guys have some great questions. I, a few of you, um, once we go back to the grants and box, I'll be scheduling meetings with you to discuss your individual needs. I think we may have covered the most of this. We tried to be as thorough as we could. Again, this was informational today for you guys only on how to submit your application, what we were looking for as you submit. We covered the rating sheet. We covered the scoring sheet. And um, the application is the only thing I think some people ask this question. So great question I'd like to address with all of you is all you need to do is submit your application. So there's nothing, the 204 and the 205 and the extra forms are all once you have been awarded. Um, I will let you guys know if folks aren't successful during this, this round, um, you will get a letter and that we will have it ex explained why. So uh, look for that, but we, everyone has an opportunity here at this time to apply for this grant funding opportunity. I think um, Kamala, it looks like you're not finding the scoring sheet. We may not have it up on our website. We'll make sure we get that up on the website, the um, scoring so you guys can kind of take a look at what we're looking for. Again, I don't, it's not to be used to, you know, use it so you can kind of address, you know, write your proposal. I'm sure it's helpful, but it is for you guys to kind of take a look at what we are looking for as we are scoring your, your application. So all you would need to upload your application to us. Again, Jen really highlighted making sure that the deadline is key for you guys because we will receive so many and we want to make sure that you guys have the time um, to submit those. Um, bye, Peggy, thank you being here and some of you guys are, are dropping off um the way we have this set up you guys we don't have a set section for q a after this but we do and the reason why we don't have that is because we'd like to capture all of your questions so we can update our faqs thank you jen for popping that in all of your general questions go ahead and send those out to grants at women you guys will get some more um thank you jenny for putting that in there i appreciate that um, we will get back to you guys though after we get off this call so we can monitor the inbox as you guys have questions Again, happy to meet with you guys. We have some time in here, it's February 17th for your final deadline date to get the applications in at 4 p.m. Um, so again, general questions go here to the grants at women. If you submit your question to the portal in which you are supposed to submit your application, we have three separated for a reason, it will not get answered. So I don't want anyone to be surprised or, or upset when you submit your question to the wrong inbox because we just do not, we won't be able to answer it. Um, Jen eloquently stated earlier that we will make sure um, that you get a response. So once you submit your actual application, you will get an auto response that we have received it. That is kind of like your check-in that we have your application. If you're submitting it at 401, it's not gonna be accepting any more applications. So just be timely with your guys' application. Um, so take the time to review, come back, ask us some questions. We cannot guarantee anybody any awards. We just want to help make sure you are successful in your application process. This recording for this webinar will be made available to you all. It's a little bit to get it downloaded from the Zoom and up on our website, but we will have a link available to you all. Um, we wish you the best of luck. Um, it is We are a very small commission. We are so happy that you guys know that we exist. We want to continue to make sure that the work of uh, what we are doing is out here to the community, that we further women and girls and success for their livelihood. Um, I have a daughter myself, so I definitely want to make sure that she's set up straight for her life and career. So I appreciate all the work that you guys are all doing here to further women and girls um, in the community. Um, Rachel, we will have a presentation available um, up on our website. We just have to give us some time to download it to get it posted on our website. Our, uh, again, I just want to give you guys to submit your application as a new grant. It'll be newgrantsatwomen.ca.gov. If you are renewing your application because you had a prior grant funding opportunity with us last season, it's renewal grants at women. And then local commissions, you guys will have your own 
um, presentation coming up all next week. So if you guys have any questions, you need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with us, um, Stephen and Jen will, will be scheduling those with me to cover any additional questions that you guys may have. Um, again, those future trainings are held next week at 11 and then again at one o'clock. Um, Jane, it looks like you have a question on, I could read it right really quick. Send me a note in the grants inbox. I have a little bit of time today, you guys. I can schedule some time with some of you guys who have some pressing questions. Happy to do that with you all. Um, but thank you guys for being here. We are going to log off. And I really appreciate you guys taking out the time of your day today to be here with us. And happy Friday. <laughs>